And greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to AMC Mailbag, the mailbag uh, spin-off show, if you will, of our daily AMC movie talk show. Now, uh, my name is John Campia. I'm the uh, editor-in-chief of AMC Movie News. And for those of you who don't know what mailbag is, just a, a quick uh, you know, lesson here. Mailbag is... Uh, the version of the weekend. Now, every day, Monday through Friday, we take a couple of questions that you guys send to us. And you can send us questions, as you can see here, anytime, 24 hours a day, to amcmovietalk at gmail.com. Now, those questions come into us. We answer a couple every single day on the show. But we get like a thousand questions every week. And we don't have time, obviously. We only have time to get to like 14 of them, 15 of them, whatever, during the week. So on the weekend, Saturdays and Sundays, we do mailbag where all we do is take your questions. So today, we are doing Mailbag Live. Uh, so this is actually streaming live, and there's already a whole bunch of you guys in the chat board joining us. Um, and you can leave questions and comments, whatever, in the chat board, chat amongst yourselves. And uh, before I go too much further, I want to introduce a very special guest who is joining me today, sitting to my right. She's gonna help me by monitoring the chat board today. My wife! Anne Campia. Hi, Anne. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, somebody asked, where's the filthy? And the filthy is here. She, she <laughs> is the filthy. If you want to know where I get uh, all my bad habits from, uh, it's from her. She is the bad influence in my life. So anyway, <laughs> we've got a whole bunch of questions to get to today. Then we're going to just take the chat board. By the way, I want to uh, remind you guys that if you'd like, you can also tweet to us. Now, you can leave questions in the chat board, but you can also tweet to us. Just hop on Twitter and send us a message and just include the hashtag AMC Movie Talk. And if you include that hashtag, it'll open up on our Twitter feed here and we can see what you're saying there. So leave comments and questions in the chat board here on YouTube. Tweet to us using a, a hashtag AMC Movie Talk and we will go that way. So I hope you all guys are having a, a wonderful day and we will get started with the first question today. And the first question today comes to us. Who does it come from? I think it comes from Matt. The first question today comes from Matt DeRocher who writes, Hey guys, been watching for months now. My question is to John. I hear you talk about opening movies and their dates all the time, but I'm not sure why you disagree with some movies opening against other movies. Is it just because you feel that uh, the everyday moviegoer is going to just choose one movie to see and that the other movie opening against it will suffer? What factors go into deciding opening weekends for movies? Uh, thanks a lot for the question, Matt. And, and yes, I mean, <laughs> there are a couple of factors for me that go into whether I think a particular opening weekend number is a good or opening weekend week date is a good date for a movie or not. Time of year, obviously you want Christmas or obviously you want Thanksgiving weekend or obviously you want sometime in the prime summer months like May, June uh, are, are turning to the big months, I guess, for the summer. So there's a bunch of those things, but yeah, what you're opening against what opened immediately the week prior to that date and what's opening in the immediate week after are things I believe studios absolutely have to take into consideration. And they do take into consideration. Um, so, for instance, if you were to have Avengers 4, okay, let's fast forward a bit. Avengers 4 opening on a particular weekend, uh, what you would not want to do is open Wonder Woman against it. Because the average film goer, not everybody's like me, like not everybody's going to go to five movies a week. The average film goer goes between eight and 14 movies a year. And that's the average film goer. The average film goer represents the majority of the box office. And then you get a lot of people who go to like 20 or 30 films a year. You get a lot of people who go to like three or four movies a year. But your average film goer goes between eight and 14 times. Okay, so you are fighting for their dollars. That means they're probably not going to go to three movies in one week, right? So if you've got a movie like Avengers 4 and you've got a movie like Wonder Woman, you are basically targeting the same audience. You are targeting the same, you're going after the same demographic basically. So it would be foolish knowing that the average film goer does not go to two movies in a week. You would be foolish to open those two movies against each other. Because it's the same, you're going after me, basically. You're going after my box office dollars because those are two movies that I would love to see. So you want to open, you don't want to open them against each other. Now, at the same time, it's not like just because you're opening Avengers 4 on a particular weekend doesn't mean you can't open anything against it, right? So you put Magic Mike 2 
I know Anne has been a big supporter of the <laughs> idea of a Magic Mike 2. All the Magic Mics, please. All the Magic Mics. Um, you put Magic Mike 2 on the same weekend. You, you're probably okay. I mean, would Avengers 4 hurt Magic Mike 2? Probably a little bit, but Magic Mike 2 is going to be going after a different audience than the audience is going to be going out to see Avengers 4. Now, there used to be a day and an age not so long ago where you didn't have to have a movie make all of its money on its opening weekend, right? Because, you know, only a certain number of films open every year. But now today, there are more wide-release films opening in theaters nationwide every year than ever before in history. So it's especially important today that movies do huge business, the, the lion's share of their business on their opening weekend. Now, everybody likes to talk about, oh, but John, word of mouth can get around. Yeah, that happens 1% of the time. But generally speaking... When you release your movie nationwide, you got to do your biggest business in that opening weekend because next week, a whole nother slate of films opens up that have huge marketing campaigns behind them and blah, 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 blah. So you're still going to make some money next week. But on average, your box office is going to drop between 55 to 65%. Sometimes, you know, it only drops like 30% and that's, that's amazing when that happens. But your box office is going to go this from week to week. Yes, there is the 1% exceptions, but if you base your planning on 1% exceptions, you're stupid. So, and you know, generally speaking, the people who run these studios are not stupid, contrary to popular belief. So all these things have to go into consideration, and that is why, yeah, absolutely, you take into consideration. You don't open Kung Fu Panda 3 against Incredibles 2. You don't open um, How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days 2 against, uh, what's a good romantic comedy? Maybe that I'm not thinking of. Oh man, I so don't know. You don't want to lose How to Lose a Guy in ten days too against another romantic comedy. You know, like you, you want to make sure your demographic is your demographic that weekend, and then you go from there. So anyway, okay. Let's. Uh, and a bunch of you guys are already tweeting us. Thank you in the Twitter board. I know. Uh, uh, Dave Coca is saying greetings from the Hammer, John. The Hammer, for those of you who do not know, the Hammer is Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, my hometown. Uh, I live in Burbank, LA right now, but that home is, is Hamilton for me, so hello to everybody. Okay, let's go on to question number two. And the second question today comes to us from Matt. And Matt writes, hi guys, you guys claim DC won Comic-Con with Batman versus Superman. However, look at the superhero films they released over the years. It's the same two heroes every time. When do we get a non-Batman and Superman hero in the... And when we do get a non-Batman or Superman hero in the movie, it's awful. In the five or so years, Marvel is giving us tons of heroes in movies with more on the way. DC is giving us Batman and Superman again. When DC can make a good superhero movie that's not Batman and Superman, then they can be up there with Marvel. But right now, it's only the same two heroes. As a DC and Marvel fan, I can say DC is losing this fight. It's a shame. So, here we go. Uh, dredging into the Holy War. The Apple versus Windows debate. Uh, the tomato-tomato debate. The great DC versus Marvel. Who makes the better films? Uh, and I'm going to ask you guys right now. Hop on Twitter. Uh, use that hashtag at AMC Movie Talk or hop on the chat board in YouTube and start, t start telling us now your opinion. Who makes the better movies, DC or Marvel? Uh, and uh, we'll go from there. And let me weigh in on this a little bit. Okay, has DC just basically given us Batman versus Superman? Sure, yeah, that's a, that's a fair assessment to say. I mean, yes, that we got a, a Catwoman movie, but that's, that's essentially a derivative of Batman. Um, we did get Green Lantern, but, you know, as you said, when they gave us something that wasn't Batman or Superman, it didn't work out so well. Green Lantern didn't work out so well. I'm going to tell you right now, I don't care what you think. I did not think Green Lantern was as bad as most people think it is. It's not good, but I didn't think it was the awful, horrendous train wreck that some people make it out to be. Uh, I actually thought Ryan Reynolds was a good Green Lantern, just that the movie didn't work. So, yeah, but still, you're talking Batman versus Superman. Here's the thing, though. Don't make the assumption that every single movie that Marvel has put out has knocked it out of the park either. Um, let's talk Iron Man 2. I, I'm, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Iron Man 2 sucked. Like, it wasn't just not good. It no. sucked. It was like the second Spider-Man, was it, where he got all emo? No, that was third, the third. Third yeah. Spider-Man, I yeah. that one. So, I mean, and now, now Spider-Man is, of course... Uh, 
Sony, but still, it's a Marvel character. So don't just make the assumption that, oh, Marvel characters do nothing but put out great movies. Look, I like Daredevil, but most of you didn't. Um, you know, uh, Iron Man 2 sucked. Spider-Man 3 sucked. Uh, a lot of people didn't like Iron Man 3. I like Iron Man 3. I thought Iron Man 3 was pretty fun. I, I liked it a lot. But I know a lot of people didn't like it at all. A lot of people didn't like the Hulk films. I mean, so let's not just make the assumption that Marvel makes all fantastic movies and DC, outside of Batman and Superman, makes nothing but bad movies. That's a false assumption. Now, you're saying in this debate between Marvel and DC that somehow it's a strike against DC that their best movies have been Batman or Superman movies. Why is that a bad thing? All that matters is good movies. I don't care if it's Batman 17. I don't care if it's Superman 24 versus Elektra 2 or uh, uh, Luke Cage 1. Just because they haven't done a Luke Cage movie before doesn't mean I want to see a Luke Cage movie over another Superman movie or another Batman movie if they're making great Batman and Superman films. So let's look at it this way too. Let's look at 2013. There have been, I believe, four, correct me if I'm wrong, there have been four major comic book movies in 2013. Three of them have been Marvel comic book based characters. One of them has been DC. So you had Wolverine, you have uh, Thor The Dark World, Iron Man 3, and Man of Steel. Okay? Just as a sample size, we're looking at, right now, at uh, 2013. To me, and this is all subjective, you may have a different opinion. Easily, hands down, the best comic book movie of 2013 out of the four that have come out, one DC film, three Marvel-based films, easily, the best one is Man of Steel. It kicks the crap out of all the rest of them. I really liked Thor 2, really liked it. I enjoyed uh, Wolverine. I could have done without the last 20 minutes of that film and they botched the entire ninja fight scene, but I liked Wolverine quite a bit. Uh, I liked Iron Man 3, really loved Thor 2, but to me, Man of Steel. The DC film, out of four films, the DC film was the best film of the year. So we can say, yeah, but it's just another Superman film. Well, who cares? As long as it's a great movie. That's all that matters. And look, a, a lot of people, I, if you ask me, the single greatest comic book movie of all time is Avengers. To me, that's just it. That's just the winner, is Avengers. But, I mean, a lot of people will make the argument that the second Nolan Dark Knight film, The Dark Knight, is the greatest comic book film of all time. So, I mean, I don't agree with that. I believe Avengers is the best of all time. But you're going to get a lot of people out there who believe that The Dark Knight is the best. Once again, a DC film. And you can't disqualify just by saying, yeah, but it's just another Batman film. Who cares? It's a great movie. And that's all that counts. Now, moving forward... Um, this is where things start to get interesting now. Now that we're moving forward. Because no doubt, DC, it's not just me saying, I'm sorry, it's just a fact. If you, you can measure this by social media, by, uh, by the amount of buzz, by the amount of tweets, by the amount of web coverage, everything. This is measurable. So this isn't subjective. This is objective, okay? Because this is measurable. DC conquered Comic-Con with the Superman versus Batman announcement. Just did. You can argue that all you want, but the statistics, the measurements, everything, you look, you look at the amount of coverage everything got, the amount of buzz, the amount of social media coverage, boom. It's, it's, you, it's not debatable. You can like what Marvel did at Comic-Con better, and that's fine for you. But objectively speaking, by measuring it, DC destroyed Comic-Con with their announcement over all the different stuff that we got from Marvel. That, you can't dispute that. Um, but now, moving forward, this is where things get interesting. Because DC has now finally taken their first steps in creating their shared universe with uh, Man of Steel. And we know they're doing Batman versus Superman. Um, where we go from here, it's, I, I think it, this whole DC versus Marvel battle thing, right now, if you were to ask me, Marvel is winning the fight. I, I mean, you know, Captain America, Thor, Thor 2, Iron Man, Avengers. I mean, they just have been rolling out really quality stuff with the odd hiccup. But Batman versus Superman, and as much as I've given up on the film, if they indeed put a Nightwing in it, but I'm not going to go into that whole debate again. But the, the reality is, 
The success, I'm not just talking box office wise, I'm talking how good the film is. The success or failure of Batman versus Superman is really going to, I think, have a huge influence in where this DC versus Marvel battle goes from here. So it's Batman versus Superman and Avengers. 2015 is going to tell us a lot about the upcoming years of the DC versus Marvel battle. Because we're going to have Avengers 2, we're going to have Batman versus Superman, and that's really going to tell us where things are going. But if you were to ask me right now, who's in the lead right now? I can't argue with it. I, I'm going to have to agree with most people and say it's Marvel. Marvel is, is clear winning. they got the greatest comic book hero of, uh, movie of all time with the Avengers, in my opinion. Uh, they've rolled out a, a larger variety of superheroes. They've proven that their franchise can succeed and their shared universe is a big success. So right now, Marvel's in the lead. Might be a different story after 2015. Uh, anybody saying anything um, in the chat board there, Anne, regarding this whole issue? Um, well, I think I started quite the debate in the <laughs> chat because I asked a simple question and got maybe a, a hundred <laughs> comments about Marvel versus DC and... It's, it keeps going. I, I lost count on if Marvel or DC is winning, but um, I'm seeing random hashtags for bat nipples. <laughs> yes, yeah, bat, they got to avoid the bat nipples. <laughs> they definitely have to avoid the bat nipples. All right, let's move on to the uh, next question. The next question today comes to us from Kenneth Stewart, who writes, Hey, MC Movie Talk, big fan of the show. My question slash comment is, why do you think uh, Emmanuel Lubezki has yet to win an Academy Award? His cinema... His cinema... Uh, why am I tripping over this word? Cinematographic vision is so vividly poetic, and I have a hard time accepting his defeat at the Oscars. His collaborations with Alfonso Cuaron have given us some of the richest photography for film that was just pure spectacle, but often pushes the narrative of the story into directions that we couldn't have guessed. And his masterwork, his work with Terrence Malick on Tree of Life, went unmerited. Sure, he was nominated, but how do you not award the cinematographer of Tree of Life? Do you think the clash of art house and blockbuster and uh, that gravity was will finally warrant him an Academy Award? Um, thanks so much for the question, Kenneth. And th this brings up a just a really huge topic for me about how can this guy have not won an award yet? How can this guy have not won an award yet? And you know, when, when you're talking about Emmanuel, I mean, that, that's a fair question. Emmanuel is one of the best cinematographers in the business. I believe he has, he has five Academy Award nominations for best cinematography. He's never won. But I have always said the hardest award in the world to win is the Academy Award. I mean, look it, look how long it took Martin Scorsese to win one. And the fact of the matter is, with an Academy Award, you can't just be great. They don't just give you an Academy Award because you're great. Not only do you have to be great, you have to be the best in that particular year. So you can overall be the best actor on the planet and never win an Academy Award. Because maybe while consistently over career, nobody puts the career together that you do, but in every single year that you got nominated, one guy out of nowhere just happened to give a little bit better of a performance that one year. And that guy may never have the career that you have and may not be able to repeat that brilliance again next year, but in that one year, they deserved it more than you. So let's look at, Emmanuel's had like five nominations. 1996 Academy Awards, he was nominated for The Little Princess, right? And he, it was beautiful, The Little Princess. But he lost to John Toll for Braveheart. Are you gonna give the cinematography award to Little Princess over the cinematography in Braveheart? I think not. Um, so, okay, so he lost out that year. The 2000 Academy Awards, he was nominated for Sleepy Hollow. But he lost to Conrad Hall for American Beauty. The cinematography in American Beauty absolutely deserved to win the Oscar that year. Okay, so let's look, move ahead now. In the 2006 Academy, uh, Academy Awards, I actually think uh, Emmanuel's best work was in the 2000, uh, 2005 film at the 2006 Academy Awards for A New World, right? But he lost to Dion Beebe for Memoirs of a Geisha, which was better that year, in my opinion. I, I can't I can't personally make an argument to give the award to Manuel over Dion that year. The Memoirs of a Geisha, while A New World I think was a better film, Memoirs of a Geisha was just, just art. It was so beautiful. So I, I can't give it to him then. His 2006 film that a lot of people think of him for, a lot of people think this was his best film uh, as far as his cinematography goes, was uh, Children of Men. 2007 Academy Awards, he gets nominated, deservedly so for that. But then he lost to Guillermo Navarro 
for Pan's Labyrinth. I can't make an argument that Pan's Labyrinth shouldn't have won. Absolutely, Pan. I, I personally believe Pan's Labyrinth easily should have won that year. So, once again, Emmanuel runs into a big roadblock. And then the film you're talking about, his 2011 film at the 2012 Academy Awards, Tree of Life, he gets nominated for Academy Award. And, you know, you can make an argument that he should have won that year. But he ran into Robert Richardson's Hugo. And the cinematography in Hugo is breathtakingly good. Like, just gorgeous good. Um, and so, while I think, unlike some of the past years, you can make an argument that I think he should have won for Tree of Life, but there's also a very, very, very strong argument that Hugo deserved to win. So you get a guy like Emmanuel who, in his career, puts together this amazing body of work. But the Academy Awards is a tough one to win because you can't just be the best. You've got to be the best in that particular year and hope that nobody else turns in their performance of a lifetime. Because if you do, then you're out of luck that year. So look, if he keeps going, he is bound to win one eventually. <laughs> if he keeps going at this rate... But um, yeah, that it just highlights, Emmanuel is a great example about how just difficult and nearly impossible it is to crack that and win an Academy Award. So, and that's what, one of the reasons why I think the Academy Awards are so special. All right, that was the third question, I think. So let's go on to question number four. And question number four comes to us from Thomas Travis, who writes, Hey dudes and dudettes, love your show, best on YouTube. Thank you so much, Thomas. My question is, do you think that the studios sometimes get rumors purring about possible actors and actresses they're thinking about for roles on social media sites uh, and leave it to marinate for a while and then check back for reactions? Example, woohoo, guys, Charlie Hunnam is Aquaman? Maybe not. Uh, I think what Thomas is asking here is, do I think that studios will put out false rumors about actors maybe getting cast in a role to see how the public reacts? Personally, no. I don't think that do, they do that. I do think sometimes studios put out rumors and put out sometimes false rumors to throw people off the scent. But do I think studios put out false rumors just to see how they think audiences will react to it? No. No. For, for a couple of reasons. Number one, they know how audiences will react to every single name. They know how audiences will react. And they, before they put, they don't have to put a name out because they've got experts in this who know exactly how fans are going to react to a certain name and a certain thing. They don't need to put it out to find out. It's just not necessary. Uh, and if they did, if I'm the owner of a studio, let's say I'm the CEO of Paramount, and I find out my vice president is so incompetent that at, at, at picking, casting, and going in certain directions that he has to put out false rumors to find, oh, what do the fans want? Because I have no idea what would be good. If, if I found out one of my presidents or one of my vice presidents or whatever was so incompetent that they had to do that, I would fire, boom, they're gone, if they're that stupid. So no, I, I don't believe for a second that um, that studios leak rumors of casting just to see how the fans react. I, I don't believe they do that. Like, if you don't believe that Warner Brothers knew exactly what the fan reaction was going to be to the Ben Affleck announcement, you're crazy. They knew exactly how the fans would react, and they know something that every studio should know. It doesn't matter how the fans react. It doesn't matter. It's flat out does not matter. You know why? Because the fans don't know how to make films. They don't. That's, that's why you and I don't make movies for a living. Trust me, I did it for a little while. <laughs> that's why you and I don't make movies for a living. Because they're the ones who know. You know, it, it's, it's not like if they had leaked out Heath Ledger. I always, I always come back to this example because it's a great example. You know, if you go back to Heath Ledger. I mean, look at the reaction Heath Ledger got when they announced him. A lot of people forget this. But the Heath Ledger thing, it, you think the backlash against Ben Affleck as Batman was bad? That was nothing. Nothing compared to the visceral, venomous, awful backlash that the studio got at the announcement of Heath Ledger, the Brokeback Mountain Boy, was going to play the Joker. If You you might be too young to remember this, but I, I, honey, I, I don't know if you remember that. It was awful. I mean, so, I mean, if you want to see homophobic rants on the internet, <laughs> that, I mean, it was, I thought people were going to riot in the streets. It was so bad. And, and then what happened? 
He was amazing. <laughs> he, he, they get Heath Ledger. They say, screw what the I fans' reaction is. Screw that. Who cares how the fans react to the news? Let's give them the movie and see what they say. Because they believe he was the right guy. And guess what? He was the right guy. Mm -hmm. So, no, I don't believe studios do that. I don't think they ever have, and I don't think they, they, uh, I don't think they ever will. And if they did, then people deserve to be fired. Uh, anyway, okay, let's move on to the fifth question. And by the way, if you want to start firing questions into the chat board, Anne is monitoring it now. She's going to start gathering some questions together, and we'll get to those in just a second. So let's move on to question number five. And question number five comes to us from Robert Coleman, who writes, Big fan of the show. Thank you, Robert. Uh, I watch every day. One thing that has always bugged me is when a big blockbuster film is getting ready to come out, and the studio announces that a sequel is already in the works and the various actors will be returning in their title roles. Don't you feel that this takes away any suspense from the first film, which isn't even released yet? Now, once you've heard the news about the planned sequel and the actors returning the whole time, you're sitting through the first film, you're thinking, well, it's obvious this character is, is going to survive, so where's the drama? Do you feel the studios should more often... Let's try this again. Do you feel that the studios should more often than they do now wait until a film has been out at least a few weeks before announcing there will be a sequel um, so suspense can be preserved for the first film? Thanks. Um, generally speaking, I think a studio should wait to announce a sequel, but not because of suspense. Look, when you're going to go see Thor, the original Thor, do you really think there's a possibility Thor dies in the movie? <laughs> that would be a surprise. <laughs> that, would, that would be a big surprise. Welcome to our five minute long movie. <laughs> Thor is dead. <laughs> Thor, in the first Thor film, they go to uh, Jotunheim to fight the frost giants and the big dog monster actually catches Thor and rips him apart. The first time it's credits roll and the movie. Hope you all enjoyed yourselves. Um, but did, did, did anybody in the world think Thor was going to die? No. When you go to see Jack Reacher or Tom Cruise, did, did anybody actually think Jack Reacher was going to die? No. I mean, I, I think we all just assume it. it is a very, 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 very rare instance where the hero, the main character dies. It happens, but it's rare. And so I, I don't think that. Plus, often when, when, when actors get signed on, don't forget that just because an actor signs on for multiple films does not mean the studio is beholden to make multiple films. Okay? So, for example, is um, Aragon, the, the movie about the dragons, based on the novel series, right? So, they signed all those actors to, I think, four film deals. But that only means, when you hear that, listen, this is very key, when you hear that a, a, an actor has signed on for X number of films... A lot of people assume that means, well, then the studio is absolutely going to make those films. No. All it means is that if a studio decides to make the next film, then those actors are required to come back and play the roles. It doesn't mean the studio is obligated to make those movies. It just means that if they do make the movies, those actors have to come back. So in, in today in the era of franchises, you will often hear, hey, they're going to start a... I don't know, a new Herbie the Love Bug franchise, for argument's sake. Um, they're going to start a new Herbie the Love Bug franchise, and uh, Ryan Gosling, they've signed Ryan Gosling onto a four-picture deal uh, to appear in the, and you're, you're nodding your head, yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan um, Gosling and anything, please. <laughs> and so, um, I, I was going to say a really bad joke. <laughs> I, I've decided to change my mind. Not, not that filthy. Okay, so um, you hear that Ryan Gosling is signed on for a four-picture deal for the Herbie Love Bug. That, that does not mean there's going to be a Herbie 2. It just means they're looking at it, they're planning for it, and they want to make sure they've got their lead actor in the first one locked up in case that it's a big success and they want to move forward. Now, sometimes, though, um, a studio is so confident in, in what's in what they're putting out and in the tracking numbers they see and all that kind of stuff that they just don't see any need to wait. As a matter of fact, sometimes it's a really good marketing plan to announce that you're making a sequel. Look, because if they're opening, uh, let's say Wonder Woman is coming out, okay? And uh, the studio m loves the movie. They, I mean, the public hasn't seen it, but they know they've seen the movie. They love the movie. They're looking at the tracking numbers. They believe it's going to do big business. Then guess what? It, then it's a really good move to announce right before Wonder Woman opens 
Wonder Woman 2 is coming in three years because that's also a good marketing bump for the first Wonder Woman movie that's just about to open. So sometimes it's a good move, sometimes it's not such a good move. 90% of the time the studios will wait to number one, see if, if the movie is a success or not, to see if it actually makes good box office money or if it loses them money, because if it loses them money, they're pretty unlikely to come back and do another one. Um, so sometimes yes, sometimes no. But like I said, I don't think it takes away any of the suspense because none of us thought that uh, you know, they thought that Thor was going to die in the first one. None of us thought Tony Stark was going to die in the first Iron Man. None of us thought Superman was going to die in Man of Steel. So, um, so that's just how I see it. Good question. Okay, last question before we get to the chat board questions. And this question comes to us from Michael Chesnier, who writes, Hey, AMC, really digging your show. Keep up the good work, guys. Thank you so much. I was pretty disappointed that the last Conan movie was such a disaster <laughs> and that Conan, which could be a fantastic character on screen, never got a good modern update. I would love to see something which follows Howard's books and the great comics that Dark Horse is releasing, Kurt uh, Busick's run, for instance. So my question is, do you think that despite the flop of the last movie, there is still a chance for a new Conan movie? Well, Michael, um, as a matter of fact, there is a new Conan movie coming. And Arnold Schwarzenegger, last I heard, Arnold Schwarzenegger is going to be in it. Uh, and the working title for the film is Legend of Conan. Apparently, the last I heard, the movie is not going to take place when Conan is king, but after Conan was king. So, you know, if you remember that end scene in the last Conan movie, you see Conan sitting on the throne. He says, but the crown sat upon his troubled brow. And he's sitting like this cool pose for Arnold. I had the big beard, uh, kind of like a Duck Dynasty beard going on. So we see Conan there. So a lot of people are assuming the next Conan movie would be him as king, but no, it happens even after that. Apparently Conan becomes bored of being king or doesn't like being king and leaves being king. And so the legend of Conan, I think, takes place after that. It's being done by Universal Pictures. It is coming. No official date has been set yet, but as far as the last time I heard, I was listening to, I think, one of the Universal Vice Presidents, and he was saying, yeah, Arnold's completely on board. We don't care how old he is. We're moving forward with this, and it's happening. Um, so, good news. Now, as far as the last Conan movie, um, man, the first 15 minutes, I thought that movie was going to be awesome. Uh, I mean, Anne and I were actually, um, we were at the world premiere. Yes. And we, we got to be there, and we got to go to the after party, and, and we saw him. We're sitting in the theater watching the first 15 minutes. I remember, like, turning, you remember that big battle scene at the beginning? Yeah. Where Conan is literally cut from his mother's stomach, and <laughs> it's like, this movie's awesome! And, um, and, and, and then it just kind of went to crap after <laughs> that. And it was unfortunate. But I, but I will say this, and I've always believed this. I thought that Conan, uh, played by... Um, Momoa. Jason, Jason Momoa. Momoa. Um, I thought Momoa did a pretty damn good job of taking the character of Conan, not just trying to imitate Arnold Schwarzenegger, but create his own Conan and make Conan his own. I thought he gave us a pretty decent Conan, but the movie overall was pretty bad. Um, but yes, hang tight. There, there is one coming. Uh, so uh, there is a Conan movie going. All right. We're going to take a few minutes now to do what uh, live streaming allows us to do, which is take a bunch of your questions. Now, as Anne looks up a couple, uh, I'm going to run down. Some of the tweets have been coming in. Um, let's see. A, a lot of people chiming in about the whole Marvel versus D thing. I think uh, Isabel uh, Beaton wrote to me and said, I think Marvel has the advantage with having movies coming out. True, they, they definitely have a more impressive roster coming out. But don't forget, we do have Batman versus Superman, so that's going to determine a lot of stuff. Um... Uh, let's see. Plenty of casting rumors. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> some people are saying YouTube's not letting me comment on the YouTube channel. Uh, yeah, it gets pretty busy in there, as a matter of fact. I mean, we've got hundreds of people in there, and they're writing things up. But anyway, uh, I'm, I got my eye on the tweet just because I'm not reading on the show. I got my eye on the, on the tweet board here, so keep tweeting if you'd like. But also leave questions in the mailbag. Anne is looking at questions in the mailbag. So, Anne, do we got anything good? I have to ask this one because it made me smile. So Okay. Roy Slay asks to me, hey, Anne, <laughs> do you argue with John about movies? Oh. To which my response is no, because I'm always right. There is no there argument. There is no argument. No, no there is no <laughs> argument. Here, here's, how, here's how a general argument goes uh, in, in our relationship. I take one position, uh, then Anne takes the other position, which by default becomes the correct position. And so... Um, <laughs> 
I mean, the, the reality is uh, that Anne, I've said this before on my Facebook, Anne controls 100% of the boob supply in our relationship. <laughs> so I'm pretty much at her will. So that's, <laughs> that's how those debates go. Anyway, what else we Moving got? on. <laughs> um, George, uh, George Madrano asked, do you know anything else about Jim Carrey being carnage or was that just a rumor? What I do know is that there was a discussion Beyond that, I can't. I, I can't say. I, I simply do not know. I simply do not know. I know there was a discussion. That much was true. But how how serious that discussion was, whether that discussion actually went anywhere, whether it was ever feasible that Jim Carrey was actually going to be Carnage, these are all things I, I don't think anybody knows the answer to, except for the immediate principles involved. Um, so the the most honest answer for me to say is I don't know. There was a talk. There was a discussion. But it might have been absolutely nothing. So that's all I can say about that. What else we got? Um, Sue, SE35, asks, what about Kate Beckinsale as Wonder Woman? Would it work? Um, Kate Beckinsale is a name that's come up a lot as Wonder Woman. It's actually one of the names that I floated. Look, there, with any casting coming out, sure, you have your dream casting. But you also have that a, a, a bucket, uh, you know, a list of names, a bucket of names of about seven or eight names that you think, Hey, you know, this might be the person I want for it. But if any of these people were in it, I'd be happy. And Kate Beckinsale is one of those names for me in that bucket of totally acceptable names. If if we were to wake up tomorrow morning and find out that Warner Brothers has announced Kate Beckinsale is playing Wonder Woman, you won't get any arguments from me. I'll be totally I, I think she might be a little old to start a franchise like this. Um... I, I might go with somebody a little bit younger just to start the franchise since, you know, you're hoping this franchise goes 10 years. Can Kate Beckinsale still be Wonder Woman in 10 years? Maybe. I mean, look, she's physically dominant. If you've seen her in action films, you know she can pull off action like nobody's business. And she's a great actress. That's the most important part here. Kate Beckinsale is a great actress and she can carry a franchise. So, uh, yeah, if we wake up tomorrow and find out Kate Beckinsale's name is being considered, A, I won't be shocked, and B, I would have no problem with it whatsoever. I would think we were in good hands. What else we got? Paul Foote asks, do you think there could be any epic, gigantic lightsaber battles in the new Star Wars film? Oh, my gosh. Well, I mean, well, what is a Star Wars movie without <laughs> a lightsaber fight? I mean, no, I, I think when J.J. Um, Abrams is sitting down with... Uh, Kevin Kennedy and they're looking at Star Wars. The first thing you write on on the page is big epic lightsaber fight number one. That, I mean, that's what you start with, and then you go from there. I can't imagine a scenario in which J.J. Abrams, Lucasfilm, Disney would be forgiven if they made a Star Wars movie without a big epic lightsaber fight. I mean, the the, the most redeemable thing about the Phantom Menace was the big lightsaber, Darth Maul lightsaber duel. That that was the one big redeeming quality about that film. That scene was epically good. Um, so, uh, yeah, I can't imagine that they wouldn't be. My, my answer to that would be absolutely yes. We'll probably see two epic lightsaber battle fights. I hope so. Maybe three, four. Maybe three, maybe four. Maybe just a whole <laughs> lightsaber fight. Maybe you'll movie. be in it. <laughs> maybe. I'm not, I'm not trying to start any rumors, but maybe I'm in it. I'm, I'm just saying. Okay, what else we got? Okay, so... Mr. Max two nine zero three asks at this point in time who or which movie do you think will win Best Picture? Twelve Years a Slave, I think Twelve Years a Slave. It's it's uh, I, I think it's their award to lose right now. I mean, some people make the argument for Gravity, and Gra if you saw me talk about Gravity, you know how much I like that movie. I love Gravity. Um, but I just don't think it's overall a good enough picture to win Best Picture. I'll be shocked if it's not nominated. It should get nominated, but I just don't think it'll win. Uh, 12 Years a Slave right now, I believe, has to be considered uh, the front winner, front runner for that. That being said, uh, I mean, we haven't seen uh, Wolf of Wall Street yet, and that, that could be a serious contender, but right now I'd have to say 12 Years a Slave. Okay. What else we got? Pedro Augusto Marquez asks, will we ever see a Grand Theft Auto movie? The thing about Grand Theft Auto is, I mean, it's like any other video game movie, right? I mean, there's not a 
single movie quality narrative to pick up on and run with. I mean, it's a it's a bunch of vignette stories, and yeah, there's some overarching themes, but it's really about running through the streets and hijacking some cars and you know driving over police officers and robbing banks and jumping out of airplanes. I mean, it's so. Look, I think we're going to see a Grand Theft Auto movie at some point, just just for the name. But don't expect it to look like what you think a Grand Theft Auto movie should look like. It's They're going to create their own story that'll have Grand Theft Auto-like action in it, uh, but it'll just be titled Grand Theft Auto. There's your title, and that's what you got. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, the title and the property is just so popular. It, it's hard to imagine a scenario in which a studio doesn't say... We need this brand. Just take the brand, take the title, pop it on the movie, and we're guaranteed to make at least $70 million on it. Um, but just don't, I just know no fans would be happy with it because it's not going to be what you think a Grand Theft Auto movie should be. So that's what I think about that. Let's take a couple more. That would be really hard. Like, yeah, because like, you're playing Grand Theft Auto yeah, right now. There would be a lot of censorship, and I don't even know how they would translate that. To yeah, be yeah like, exactly. Um, we were playing the other day. A friend of ours was over <laughs> Schnepp was over here actually. John Schnapp was at our place and so Anne's got Grand Theft Auto hooked up to the TV right now. So he goes, oh man, can I play this? Yeah. And he spent some time mugging and murdering a pregnant woman <laughs> in the street. I know, we shouldn't laugh, but that's the... We shouldn't that's laugh. The, that's the game. Shame and on you, Schnapp. How would you put that in a movie? How yes. do you put that in a movie? <laughs> okay, what else we got? Um, actually, this is my question for you. I oh, just okay. thought of it as I'm uh -oh. reading through all these comments. Um, do you think that we're going to see any kind of character crossover of the Avengers into the Guardians film? And if so, because there has to be a link, I think. And if so, who do you think is going to connect the movies? Well, I happen to know <laughs> that you are currently reading all of the Guardians of the Galaxy comics. Yes. <laughs> and you are pretty much, you probably know more, you, no, it's not probably, you know more about Guardians of the Galaxy than I do. Because you probably read actually more than I have, because you've even caught up to all the modern stuff. Yeah. And you were pointing out to me the other day that... Iron Man is actually in the Guardians of the Galaxy for a period of time. What do they call them? The, the Cosmic Avengers. The Cosmic Avengers, yes. whatever. Um, I don't think so, though. I think not in this Guardians of the Galaxy movie. I mean, if if any of the Avengers were in this Guardians of the Galaxy movie, I mean, they're done shooting it. Guardians of the Galaxy is done. It's in the can. We would have heard about it. I mean, some that would have got spilled. There's no way you can keep that a secret. That would have got spilled. So maybe an after credit scene, maybe a quick cameo. Um, but I doubt we're going to see uh, any significant uh, other Marvel Cinematic Universe characters involved in Guardians of the Galaxy. At least the first one, if there is more. I don't know what their plans are for the future. Yeah, I, I, I personally, reading the comics, hope we see Iron Man or Thor or something. But right. we'll see. Um, so, Anthony Williams asks... Is AMC going to do a review of Catching Fire, and are you excited for the movie? All right, you know what? Big announcement time. Uh, I'm going to announce something here that maybe it, now's not the right time to announce it, but I'm, I'm going to let you guys know. I did say uh, a few about two months ago. I said we are moving into phase two for AMC Movie News. Uh, phase one was just getting AMC Movie Talk established and getting AMC Mailbag established. Phase two kicked off with us moving into a new studio for AMC Movie Talk. But I also did mention we got some new shows coming. Some new weekly shows that we're going to be launching uh, maybe even before January. But I will, I'm will i not going to tell you what the other shows are. We're going to still have our daily AMC Movie Talk. We're still going to have our weekend AMC mailbags. But we're launching several other new weekly shows. And one of those shows, although it won't necessarily be weekly, it might only be like two times a month, sometimes three times a month. We are launching a new show called AMC Spoilers. And it's going to be just like the reviews we've done so far that are meant, not meant, like most film reviews are meant to help you decide if you should go see a movie or not. That is not what AMC Spoilers is going to be. AMC Spoilers is going to be us sitting around and it's for people who have already seen the movie. So you are not welcome to watch our review of Thor The Dark World if you have not already seen Thor The Dark World. Because we are going to go into the all the specifics about the movie. We're going to give away all the spoilers. We're going to know everything about that movie if you just listen to us. So you don't want to watch AMC spoilers if you haven't seen the movie yet. It's meant to be a discussion. Kind of like ESPN, right? You watch the football game on Monday night. And then if you're like me, you watch ESPN Sports Center the next day to hear them talk about the game that we all already watched. That's kind of what AMC spoilers is. It's like an after show for movies. So... 
Um, I wasn't originally planning on doing one for Hunger Games Catching Fire, but since it looks like we're going to be putting together and launching, it looks like AMC Spoilers may be the first new show that we launch. And so I'm going to say yes, we will probably launch it with uh, Hunger Games Catching Fire. So we will do one for Hunger Games Catching Fire. There you go. What else we got? Let's take two more and then we'll call it a night. Oh, this is hard. Okay. Um, do you, th uh, Joseph SFL asked, do you think the reason we haven't seen an incredible sequel since Disney acquired Marvel and Pixar is that they are avoiding superhero type films that are not part of the Marvel comic book universe? Nope. Nope. It has nothing to do with it. Uh, we, we've heard them talk about that. Uh, Disney, first of all, Pixar which at Disney is, is basically kind of on the animation side is run by John Lasseter. And John Lasseter is not going to let any other division of Disney tell him what they can or cannot do. John Lasseter is going to do with Pixar whatever the hell John Lasseter wants to do. Uh, so no, that, that has absolutely nothing to do with it. A lot of it has to do with Brad Bird and availability and getting the right story and all that kind of stuff. I think they need to get their, their act in gear and give us an Incredibles 2 and give us one soon. We've been dying for it. I, I, look, I appreciate all the sequels that Pixar has given us other than Cars 2. I like Monsters University, Toy Story 2 and 3 are just breathtakingly beautiful, awesome films, yada, yada, yada. But we want Incredibles 2, so please give it to us. But no, I don't think Marvel has anything to do whatsoever with the lack of an Incredibles 2. All right, so the last question. Brandon Martin asks, with everyone raving about 2015, it got me wondering, has there ever been a year for movies that has been talked about and looked forward to as much as we are about 2015? No, I, I'm not that I can think of whatsoever. And I've been following films for a long time. Look, even if all 2015 was, if all 2015 was new Star Wars, Avengers 2, and Batman vs. Superman, by itself, boom, most looked forward to movie year ever uh, but but it's more than just that there is a lot of big high profile mm -hmm. blockbuster films coming out that year um it's it's going to be huge i can't think in my memory of any year that has come close to this now maybe all these movies will suck i mean maybe it won't be end up being a good year for movies but you're going to have a hard time convincing me that there'd be one, uh, another year of movies that wasn't as anticipated. And there are a ton of sequels, too, that aren't those big blockbusters you're talking about, but just sequels to movies that I personally liked that are coming out as well. Yeah, I mean, like, like Jurassic World and a lot like that. I mean, it's going to be such a huge movie uh, year. I'm going to take just a couple of questions here from the chat board. Uh, Anna Salmaso is writing, Catching Fire box office, over under $120 million. I'm assuming you mean opening weekend. Uh, easily over. I would actually set the, I would set the over under at 135. That's where I would set the over under. But, but I do believe uh, Catching Fire will be over $120 million. I don't know if it'll go over 135, but I think it'll go over $120 million. Um, let's see. Uh, Tyrone Bergney on Twitter. It writes and he asks, will we see another Howard the Duck movie? The first one was a masterpiece. Masterpiece, oh, I tell you. Um, I love that movie. <laughs> I'm going to tell you right now. I, I said this before. I believe this. I believe there is a chance that a Howard the Duck could be on the big screen again. I really do. I think you could do it for a reasonable budget. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I think there there's a novelty factor to it. But would, they, would Howard be that costume puppet again or do you think they would cgi him this time around i don't know <laughs> i think that could go either way i think that's a coin toss yeah i think you could go full costume i think you can go full cgi i think there's a chance i really do and i'm not just trying to be blind optimist here i li i honestly think there's a chance we can see hired the duck on the big screen again within the next five years so i'm gonna take one more from the chat board here um uh, man sorry about the pause here You know what? I, uh, <laughs> uh, it's, too, it's too confusing to read. Uh, so I'm just going to call it a day. It's been 50 minutes. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, guys. Um, we really appreciate you joining us here on the show. I want to thank, of course, my wife, Ann Campia, for joining me today and helping me out by keeping track of the chat board. Thanks for having me. Thank you guys for being here. And listen, um, 
do me a favor. If you really want to support the show, people are often asking, how can we support the show? How can we support the show? We don't need your money. What would be cool, though, is, is if you tweeted about the show, put it up on your Facebook page or whatever, get the word out, um, use the hashtag AMC Movie Talk uh, in your tweets that you put out about us or to us. That would really help us out a lot, too. Uh, and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. That will keep you up to date on everything going on in the world of movie news and, of course, our daily AMC Movie Talk show and our weekend AMC Mailbag show. Um, and I think we're going to do this again tomorrow. I think Anne, and are you are you available to help me out with the show again tomorrow? I'm literally just asking her this for the yes. first time right now. Okay, so Anne will do the show. We're going to do this again tomorrow morning. So make sure you come back and join us for that. Thanks a lot, guys. Keep talking in the chat board. Keep tweeting. Uh, just because we're off the air doesn't mean we're not watching. So thanks a lot, guys. And until next time, my name is John Campia for AMC Movie Talk. And until then, bye-bye.